What you are seeing is what the CCTV camera at the entrance to the armor tunnel was recording at the time of the crash. Nothing. Because it was switched off, even though it was usually switched on 24 hours a day. Was that just another coincidence? Or something more sinister? Well, you do ask a good question. You say, how is it that every single traffic camera in that yeah. tunnel was yeah. switched off for not working? Even though no cameras recorded the crash, it is beyond doubt that a white Fiat Uno collided with Dodie and Diana's car in the tunnel and contributed to their deaths. The French police tried to deny its existence at first, but too many eyewitnesses saw it and paintwork from a white Fiat Uno was found on the Mercedes where the two cars had collided. So, who was driving it? Suspicions fell on James Anderson, a photographer with connections to the Secret Services. He had been following Dodie and Diana earlier in the month during their holiday in the Mediterranean, but he was not amongst the paparazzi who were waiting outside the Paris Ritz on the night of the crash. Anderson was a millionaire paparazzo, uh, a very well-known member of the paparazzi on the continent, made a great deal of money out of royal pictures lived in some style in the French countryside. He told police that he wasn't in Paris on the night of the crash, but gave two completely different accounts of where he had been. His wife and son also gave him contradictory alibis. Privately, he told friends that he had been there in the tunnel in Paris that night. Crucially, Anderson owned a white Fiat Uno. It was said of this Fiat Uno that it was up on chocks and didn't work. Well, that appears to be untrue too. It was driven many hundreds of miles around the French countryside. So the whole question of the Philip Duno and who was driving it, which is of course absolutely crucial, totally crucial to the investigation, has never been resolved. And you have to say, why? In May 2000, Anderson's body was found in a blazing car in Woodland near Montpellier. In a Ministry of Defence field, shooting range field, in a car which was burned out, and locked, but no keys were in the car or in his pocket. And the police claimed he had committed suicide. They claimed this, even though the fireman who found him says he saw two bullet holes in Anderson's skull. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to point out that it's difficult for a man to shoot himself twice in the head and then set fire to his own car before dying. No, you were, you were seen in those clips there, raising your own questions that you wrote about in your book. Let, let's talk for a second about those, the, the, those cameras being off. Did you get to the bottom of how rare that is? Was it just a co obviously it was just a coincidence? Um, the police claimed it was just a coincidence, but very rare occurrence, particularly for the whole of the route, that specific route. Uh, because don't forget, had he gone the normal way, he would have turned right um, of the Place de la Concorde to go up the Champs Elysees, which led to Dirty Flat. He didn't. He crossed Place de la Concorde down to the river and went along the other road to the Alma Tunnel. Not the normal route. Though that was the route that the cameras were switched off on. And this man had, I think it was 3000 something hundred dollars in his pocket in cash, the driver. I'm not suggesting he so he volunteered to commit suicide, mm. but I think he was paid. He he'd also had two hundred twenty thousand dollars paid into his account from intelligence sources in the previous four or five years. And this day, we believe he was given that money to take that specific route. He probably believed they were going to stop the car, perhaps kidnap Dodie or do something. He didn't think they were going to try and kill them. Mm. Tessa, as an investigative journalist, watching that, um, perhaps you, facts you hadn't heard before, are your antennae interested in this now? No, because that has been heard before on British television. And actually, one thing that concerned me at the time was the blaming of the paparazzi at the time of her death, when there was no evidence for that. Um, the paparazzi were rounded up, uh, sort of uh, uh, accused without evidence, uh, treated absolutely appallingly, and all their photographs pretty much seized, actually. That kind of behaviour is clearly unacceptable. And I speak that as a member of the press uh, for the paparazzi. Uh, they were then uh, accused of, of her death, and ever more, uh, in this 
country anyway, the paparazzi would be given a bad name and uh, calls for privacy law came in, which I very much opposed and campaigned against mm -hmm. at the time and still do. Uh, so I think when it comes to evidence uh, and, and sort of uh, denying uh, the, the, the press their freedom to tell the public what information they have, for photographers to give photographs that they did take at the time that they have. Uh, I know the CCTV wasn't on, but there were a huge number of photographs taken. Um, that, that is a problem. That's censorship mm. yeah. of people's right to know about I what happens in a news event in public. I do want to get to, to get to this question though because uh, I don't remember having heard that this man died in a field who owned a white Fiat. Again, a series of coincidences. Uh, what more is known about that, if anything? About well, we know that the paint on his white Fiat matched perfectly the paint found on the Mercedes. It was from the right batch of the right year and that was all confirmed by Fiat. Um, You've got to look at the other things, though. You see, not just the, the CCTV cameras being out. You've got to say, why did the police scrub down that road with, with, with detergents and reopen it to traffic after just a few hours? Had it been a Miss Nobody in London, they'd have kept the road closed 24 hours after such an accident and three people dying. There, it was reopened in hours, having been scrubbed down. Why were the criminal brigade given the job of investigating and not the traffic police? Well, let's, let's uh, have a look at our next clip and see what that raises, because we're looking here at what might have motivated the establishment to silence Diana anyway. There was a powerful reason why the secret services of Britain, France and America might have wanted Diana dead. It was Diana's involvement in the campaign to ban landlines. In the 1990s, some 85 million mines lay in wait in 62 countries. 2,000 people were being maimed or killed by them every month. A worldwide movement to ban anti-personnel landmines gathered speed during 1996. To everyone's surprise, even the world's most powerful politician was sympathetic to the ban. To end this carnage, the United States will seek a worldwide agreement as soon as possible to end the use of all anti-personnel landmines. Diana. Princess of Wales, took up the cause of the vengeance. In January 1997, she visited Angola, resulting in the greatest photo opportunity that the landmine campaign had ever had. One down, one down, one, one million to go. Firing. Her involvement caused huge anger amongst governments. In Britain, government defence minister Earl Howe denounced her. Two newspapers this morning quoting unnamed minister described as a loose cannon. This is an important sophisticated argument and it doesn't help simply to point at the amputees and say how terrible it is. I very much regret that because of her position she gets so much publicity for it. Simone Simmons was with Diana in February 1997 when a government defence minister made a threatening phone call warning the princess to end her involvement with the campaign otherwise accidents could happen. We were sitting down having tea one day and the phone went in, in her little lounge and she picked it up and then called me over and there was a voice um, that was in the middle of a conversation saying, don't meddle in things you know nothing about. Accidents can happen. She went a bit pale. She took it as a threat and she said that was Nicola Soames. <laughs> Well, fascinating. Nicholas Soames, Very. grandson of Winston Churchill, a bastion of the establishment, here accused, hearsay, hearsay perhaps, um, of making a phone call, threatening phone call to Diana. Was she just a headache or was she a danger at some point to national security, do you think, now? I think she was. Um, Bill Clinton promised her in August that year that he would vote in favour of a ban on landmines at the Oslo Conference which was due to take place on the 19th of September. There was enormous pressure from um, the military in America to get him to stop that, to change his mind. Enormous lobbying of the White House. But because he had promised her in front of Hillary Clinton, when Dan had been staying with them, and had publicly said it in that August, we know he was not a very strong moral person for various other stories. And it was thought by the military that with Diana alive, he would not change his mind. He would definitely vote in favour of a ban, which they did not want. Of course, after her death, 19 days later, Bill Clinton went to Oslo and voted against 
a ban mm. on, on landmines. Mm. The only so, voice, in fact, of the West that voted that way, which he would never have had the moral courage to do had she been alive. I, I have a letter here from the National Security Agency. After Dana's death in 1998, less than a year after death, newspapers around the world were pushing the CIA, the FBI, and the National Security Agency to reveal their papers on Diana. What did they hold? They all came up with one answer, that they would keep back certain pages. The, the NSA We're kept very back short on time, 100, and right, to 124 on. pages, that it would seriously jeopardize the security of the United States of America to release those pages. So they'll never be released. Thank you. Atessa, final word, 87 cuts to get it into, into Britain. Do you think this will ever be shown in Britain? Well, it should be. I mean, I don't agree with raising yet more of the same old conspiracy theories, but I do believe in freedom of speech, and so it should be shown. Otherwise, it will fuel yet more conspiracy theories that it's been banned for the wrong reasons, as it were. Um, by the way, I think the idea that uh, Diana was some sort of uh, freedom fighter for republicanism or some radical cause is absolutely ludicrous. She was very much towing the establishment line. In fact, when New Labour came in, uh, she was in talks with them about what maybe she could do for the new political establishment. No, final, final word. Diana said, I'm going to show you, so look what I do next. Do you remember on the yacht? Yes, indeed. I think she was also, she was going to actually take up uh, war syndrome, stress syndrome, and fight for that too, which also would have appalled course, the military. Famously, she was involved at the end of her life with Dodi Fired, an Arab and a Muslim, but again, that's just... Not liked by the establishment at all. Not liked by the establishment. The future king would have a, a Muslim, uh, perhaps half-brother, half-sister. Well, let's see if it ever gets shown. Thank you both for joining me. And I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on this very exciting Sydney politics. It leaves me to say a warm thank you to my guests, Noel Botham and Tessa Mays. Thank you again. Thank you. We'd love to hear your views on this techy subject, so please email us at the address on the screen, cinepolitics at presstv.co.uk, or you can join our Facebook fan page for the latest news. And why not join the debate with your questions or suggestions for future films to discuss? But for now, goodbye. Bye.